Where are you zooming in from? I am in uh, Nicasio, California, in West Marin. Oh. Yeah. I went to a meditation retreat at a ranch in Nicasio. Did you? What was an what was the name of the I, retreat? I don't know? remember the name of the ranch uh -huh. and we were told not to say the name, but it was a uh, they had these like really fuzzy little cows there. Um and interesting. It and it backed along this watershed and the family was working to restore the watershed through rotational grazing. Anyway, it was my first time in Nicasio. Oh, okay. Well, there's a lot of that here. You'll see a lot of uh, fuzzy and not so fuzzy cows here, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How long have you been there? I've been here about seven and a half years. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, well, thanks for agreeing to do our little podcast. Sure. Um, we are releasing season one next Monday. Okay. Um, so you'll get to get the full lineup of guests. Um, but the purpose of the podcast is really just to do storytelling around people's strategies for social change. Okay. Um, and so I'd love to just start with like how you got started in your business and, and what that kind of process was for you. Sure. Uh, well, actually, it's a very long story. It's not something that I, I woke up one day and said, you know, I'm going to start this company making uh, <laughs> cheese from plant milk instead of uh, cow's milk. Uh, it's been a long trajectory of uh, of growth and transformation and obstacles and uh, overcoming them over the last 30 years, ever since I decided that one day I was no longer going to uh, consume animal products of any sort whatsoever back in the 1980s. And uh, I started my exploration of alternative foods at that time, if you want to call it that, that, that term terminology didn't exist at the time. But for me, it was really just like, how do I satisfy my cravings when I'm no longer uh, going to eat animal products of any sort whatsoever. How do I do that? How do I replace the rich flavors that I had gotten accustomed to? How do I have that delicious wedge of cheese on a cheese platter? How do I satisfy my cravings? And how do I not only satisfy my cravings, but how can I satisfy others? And food became my form of activism because I had become a vegan because i finally learned back in the 1980s, there wasn't much, you know, obviously it was pre-internet. There just wasn't that much information about what was going on in the world in terms of the food system. But, you know, as a young child, I had decided to become vegetarian because I made the connection between the an annual an animal that was living and, you know, the, the steak or the pork chop on my plate. And, and I just didn't want to consume that. But I didn't, didn't know anything about the dairy industry until I read some article in the 1980s, some random article about what the dairy industry really was like um, and how it was really just really no different from the meat industry. And it was in some ways worse. And when I read that um, and its impact on, on climate change, et cetera, which was another term that we didn't know about, but we did know about uh, you know, um, it, pollution and destroying ecosystems, et cetera. Um, I, at that point decided I wasn't gonna consume milk or eggs anymore. And at that point, uh, life became very, very hard, but also became a challenge for me. It was a challenge to figure out how do I replace the food system with foods that are equally delicious, uh, equally nutritious, or if not more so, and, and less damaging to people, planet, and animals. Um, and so I started, um, I became a chef. I started writing cookbooks. I started uh, teaching myself how to cook. I started creating these, these, uh, these very expansive dinners every single week where I would invite all these people to my house. I was living in a little tiny apartment in Tokyo and you could just like, it was literally like two rooms in a tiny kitchen and you had to sit on the floor to eat these meals. And I would go in my kitchen and I would serve these 12 course meals. And, and one thing led to another and, and I just started starting different businesses. So over the last 30 years, I've had everything from uh, bakeries to restaurants, catering companies. I had a so-called alt meat company back in the 1990s, making uh, vegan steak and chicken and a, and a turkey and, and that sort of thing. And uh, you know, writing sick cookbooks, teaching people, really just in trying to empower people to take control of their plate, 
In other words, um, it's not just about by you know, making a certain product, it's about the responsibility that each and every single one of us has to help determine the future of the planet, the future of humanity, the future of animals. And we can talk about, we can complain about governments, we can complain about uh, you know, whatever, not governments not doing enough, but at the end of the day, it's our choices that determines what the food system is going to be. And that may seem overwhelming, but at the end of the day, we as individuals ha have to decide what are we going to eat today for the planet, for the animals, for humanity? Um, and so, yeah, that's how I got started. It's just one thing kind of morphing into another, trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work, what communicates to people, what inspires them, what frightens them. Um, and eventually, you know, cheese was kind of like the last hurdle, like no one had really conquered it. And I felt like, okay, there's got to be a way. What is the way? Oh, oh. What is the way? You know, the way is really sort of an evolution of history, an evolution of traditional cheese making that's gone on for thousands of years. I mean, mankind, humankind has had 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years to figure out how do you turn uh, mammalian milk into uh, a variety of cheeses through natural fermentation, through biological activity, enzymes and molds and yeast, you know, they're all in the air around us or in different plants or uh, the lining of a of a of a the stomach of a cow, et cetera. There's you know all of these things exist, and nature can actually create these amazing foods. And so my question was, well, can I do that with plant milk? How can I take plant milks, different kinds, whether it's from cashews or pumpkin seeds or watermelon seeds or macadamia nuts or whatever, legumes, oats? How can I inoculate them with the same kinds of cultures and enzymes? And can I turn that into something that is like cheese, it's its its own thing. To me, um, that was the biggest question was, what is plant milk fermentation all about? How does it work? And I started experimenting with that in the early 2000s. And over the course of a number of years, um, I learned that some things fermented beautifully, other things didn't really work. Um, you know, there, it, I'm trying to figure out as well as other people that are doing the same thing now, in a matter of a couple of decades, what humankind has had 2000 years or more to figure out. So it's, it's a new science in some ways. It's very, very exciting. But for me, it's really a continued evolution of something that we've been doing for thousands of years. So at what point, so you are living in Tokyo, you're mm -hmm. making these complex vegan dinners, at, in the 80s and 90s? 80s, am I yeah. yeah, 80s, yeah. yeah. And just knowing the rich culinary history of Tokyo and how veganism is not a huge part of that culinary history. No, not at all. It was not at all. Like no one knew what it was back then. <laughs> so what was that like for you? Well, you know, it's really weird because I think as humankind, we forget history very, very quickly. We all believe that uh, whatever we're doing at the time, at the moment that we're alive is the way it's always been. So, you know, we live in a culture where people eat burgers and chicken nuggets, and we think, well, that's what, you know, humankind's been eating for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Um, but it's not the case. I mean, it, we're, we're at just a little microcosm moment in human history. And when I was living in Japan at the time, uh, Western influence had sort of infiltrated Japan. And there were French and Italian restaurants absolutely everywhere. And Japanese were discovering this. And they were also super creative, like taking Western tradition and just turning it on its head and just creating these amazing foods that were sort of a marriage, a fusion that were just like so far beyond what you, know, you could get in America at the time. It was pretty amazing. But what the Japanese had forgotten was that for 800 years, Japan was actually a vegan country by royal decree. It was a Buddhist country. And the emperor back in the, I think the 13th century or something decided, okay, we're gonna, or maybe earlier than that, you know, this, we're no, it was illegal to eat a four-legged creature in Japan. And you weren't supposed to eat any flesh whatsoever because it, by royal decree, you were supposed to be a Buddhist and Buddhists don't eat animal products of any sort because it's, they practice do no harm. Um, and, uh, of course, people, you know, the Japanese weren't strict, strict vegans, and they did people that lived along the sea did fish and and they would catch birds, et cetera, but but they didn't kill four-legged creatures. 
Um, and a lot of them were actually vegan. I mean, they that that was the tradition. And that tradition continues in Buddhist temples today. You can get the most elaborate, most amazing, what's called shojin ryori. Uh, the, the, you know, this is the veganism of the, of the spiritual person. And it's the food is like, it'll just blow your mind. It is so mm. intricate and elaborate, so beautifully prepared and delicious. Um, but the Japanese have forgotten that. Um, you know, after they killed the first cow in the 19th century, there's actually a statue where it stands today. Uh, and of course, Kobe beef is all the, uh, the rage today. Um, so, but they've forgotten it, just like we all forget the, the expanse of history and we can only see what we see right now. I mean, you know, people say to me all the time, the world's never going to go vegan. So why are you even trying? And the way I look at it is like 15 years ago, nobody ate Brussels sprouts. <laughs> It was on, it's on every menu now, but 15 years ago, the idea of Brussels sprouts was disgusting because you only ate it boiled. So things do change, but you forget that. And you can only remember what's happened in the last two or three years. So I really do believe that we can, we can return to a more compassionate uh, diet, a, comp a diet that honors the living, uh, live, all living beings, all animals who, who just want to live their lives, just like you and I want to live our lives. Mm. And it's, it's our evolution as humanity. It's not just about, you know, animals have rights too, but it's really about what kind of humans do we want to be? Do we want to be the kind of humans that continue to exploit the planet, exploit animals, exploit people? You know, at one time we thought it was fine to exploit blacks, that they were just a different species of humankind and they were meant to be slaves. And we believed it. People believed it here in the United States. And in other parts of the world as well, too. You know, slavery has been a part of human history for thousands of years. Um, but now we know that isn't right. And I am hoping that the same sort of evolution will happen in our hearts, in our minds, about other living beings on this planet, too. Because the reality is uh, we're destroying um, most of, we're destroying biodiversity on this planet. And uh, through our activities, a lot of it which is tied to food. Um, yeah. So really, at the end of the day, it's not just about animal rights. It's really about who are we going to be? Who do we want to be as a human race? Yeah. What is our legacy? That's exactly right. Yes. So you're pioneering this return of the vegan diet in Japan. Yes. How did you get to the U.S.? Oh, that's a, that's a long story also, but I'll keep it short. Um, things were going pretty well in Japan and I was ex expanding my business and I was going to open a restaurant and I got involved with the wrong people. Turned out one of my business partners was linked to the Yakuza. This is a real story, <laughs> Japanese mafia. And my life just became absolutely miserable and I had to get out of town. So, you know, it was like, do I want to get in bed with these people? And then that's it for the rest of my life. Or do I get out when I can? So I got out <laughs> anyway. So that's how I came back to the United States. Uh, a little more colorful story than a lot, you know, but it's, it's, it was really true. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> gang member exile. Yes. Yeah. Well, I wasn't actually a gang member, but I was, no, no, no. I mean, I was like making a business deal with someone who turned out to be Yakuza. And the pressure for me to do certain things, it, it was like um, all of a sudden I was going to have to like sign my life away. And I was like, oh. I don't want this. You know, I don't need this restaurant this badly. I don't need this. And so I so got when out. I hear you say you moved back to Japan, I mean, back to the U.S., you were born in the U.S. and then lived in Japan. No, I was born in Japan, moved to the U.S., and then I moved back to Japan. Got it. Yeah. And then you move back to the yeah. US. Back yes. and forth, back and forth, yep. and back and forth. So tell us then, you have you're obviously an entrepreneur and a businesswoman. Like, how do you understand the role of business and social change? Well, that's definitely been evolving. And I think that uh it's you know, I think there's a lot of uh, I don't know, greenwashing in this space today. There's a lot of so-called impact investing and impact businesses and, and businesses saying, you know, I'm here for uh, for the betterment of the world, et cetera. 
Uh, there, I don't think there's a lot of um, Patagonian CEOs around in the world, to be perfectly honest. And um, I, I remember one CEO called me up one day out of the blue and he said, I just want to know, how do you become authentic? How do you have an authentic mission? And I was like, whoa, this is like, if you have to ask that question, you clearly don't have an authentic mission. But the pressure for businesses to have a mission today is so great that everyone is sort of spinning some mission that they supposedly have, which probably at the end of the day, they really don't have. Um, so uh, there's so much greenwashing, I think, today in business. I think business really does have potential to impact the world, but I don't think a lot of them are sincere about it. And I think true change needs to take place. At the end of the day, um, it begins with the individuals running the business, running the board, uh, making the investments. And if they don't evolve, then it's it's just all greenwashing and you know everyone's got to have values and mission today. Um, and none of it really means anything at the end of the day. I mean, so um, it's, you know, it's a mixed bag. I'm not, I'm not giving up on it, just like I'm not giving up on anything. But, um, you know, we really do have to, um, I think, inspire, inspire consumers and, and people. And they're the ones that are going to drive the change. They're the ones that are going to finally say, I've had enough of your BS. I'm not going to buy from you. Um, you know, I thought you stood for this and it turns out you don't. Um, and so we really have to appeal to people, to individuals. We have to change the hearts of consumers because they're the ones that will, I think, ultimately change business. And we're sort of in that transition period right now. I think it's better today than it was 20 years ago, but I think it's going to be better in 20 years than it is today. It sounds like you're appealing to people's stomachs first by yes. making delicious food but then storytelling so that you can appeal to their heads as well. And their hearts. Ab absolutely, heads and hearts. I mean, we if nothing's going to really change. Otherwise, you're just changing products. You know, products are not the solution. Ultimately, it's us as individuals that are going to make change in the world. And so as a business leader, if you really do care about the direction this planet is heading, the direction that humanity is heading, you have to really think deeply about... Um, how are you going to communicate to people? And of course, the product is, you know, we have to sub, we have to provide alternatives to destructive products. But at the end of the day, it's not the product that's going to save the world. It's going to be um, individuals, people that will save the world. And in order to, uh, to facilitate that, business leaders have to actually really care and create messaging and storytelling to influence people in that way. So tell me a little bit about like the arc of success of Miyoko's because I can imagine there was also a long journey from arriving back in the US and deciding to kind of throw yourself all in to this notion of plant-based cheese making. Well, so when I, I came back to the United States and um, uh, I think it was 1989. So it was a while back. And the first thing I did was start a bakery. And then uh, I had a restaurant. And then I had a natural food company making uh, alternative meats. And uh, while they all, you know, back in the, the dot com era, I started this alt meat company. And I had distribution nationwide and, and lots of accolades, lots of media, uh, lots of press because I was doing something that other people weren't doing and the food and it was really tasty. It was really, really good. Um, but at the same time, um, I just could never reach that point of financial success and I couldn't raise any money because all the money was going into dot coms at the time. Uh, nobody was interested in food. Today, everyone's interested in food. Back then, nobody was. So I eventually had to get out of, I had to borrow money and uh, the loan was due and I couldn't pay it back. And so I literally had to sell the company for just enough money to pay back the loan because the buyers knew what, you know, they, they see the balance sheet, they know how much you owe. And I really had no alternative, but to, to sell the company. Um, so I can't say that I've always been, everything I've ever done has been successful. Um, and then the cheese company really just started out of um, 
you know, me selling that company, going through a period of depression after, you know, feeling like a failure and then saying, you know, but I still miss cheese. And so I started playing around with cheese in my kitchen and culminated in writing a book called Artisan Vegan Cheese, which was the first book ever published on the subject of uh, making cheese through uh, fermenting plant milks. And that became really um, a hot seller. And eventually I started uh, Miyoko's in 2014. Um, and, you know, it went, things went much better uh, with Miyoko's in the very, very beginning. Um, I think, you know, we helped create the category, the entire category of sort of artisan vegan cheese, or just, you know, the idea that you could actually have something that was beautiful, lovely, that you could bring to a, you know, Christmas party, a holiday party, um, and share with friends without having to say, you know, be embarrassed that it was vegan or something like that. So, you know, my, my goal really with the company, um, it wasn't just to make product, but really to elevate veganism, make veganism exciting, sexy, um, you know, sort of like what Elon Musk did with the electric car, um, trying to make it sexy and, and, and me too. Like I'm trying to do the same thing with food. I really do believe that eating compassionately is the sexiest way to eat, the most exciting way to eat. And if, if I can make foods that are beautiful and attractive um, and that entice people, then, then it just makes it so much easier for people to start thinking about food. Um, you know, once they start thinking about food, their mind opens up. It's like when you, you know, you're shopping for a car and you've never heard of, let's say a Volt before. And then all of a sudden you hear about it. And next thing you know, you see them everywhere. It's the same thing. Like most people go through life really never thinking about their food choices. But when you do start thinking about it and you realize that, that certain, you know, so-called alternative foods exist, all of a sudden you start thinking, your mind starts expanding. And all of a sudden you start thinking about all the consequences tied to your food choices. And, and you know, so food can be a, a really effective form of, of activism, in my opinion. I know the leap in consumer packaged goods and food goods from like small artisan to mm -hmm. whole foods distribution is massive. And we have a lot of folks who are in the sort of CFS orbit that are working to create businesses like yours that are financially viable with a national footprint. Like what was that process for Miyoko's? Like how did you go from? Well, in the very beginning, I had no intention of going national. I'd done that before with my alt meat company and I just wanted to keep it really small and kind of regional or local. And uh, so my, my goal was, you know, we had online sales now. So I was gonna do online sales and I was gonna open up a little cheese shop in Fairfax, California. And I got this little play, place and, you know, we, we divided the company, the space up into the little manufacturing area and then the little cheese shop. Um, and uh, we started selling online and the cheese shop never opened up because within three months, uh, Whole Foods NorCal came to us and said, you know, we want to carry your product. And it was all over from there. Um, there was just no way to really, um, it was a different separate business, the cheese shop was, and we just couldn't do it. So, you know, I think there's a lot of things involved um, going national. Uh, and from a food safety standpoint, you know, one of the things that's really important to think about is what the risks get bigger. Um, and so when a lot of small producers start to um, grow, uh, they often forget about the quality and the QA end in terms of like food safety and they run into problems. And there are other little tiny cashew cheese companies that have gone, that gotten bigger and they've had recalls um, and had problems in that respect. So I think it's really, I mean, that's one thing I would really caution people, unless you're making something like cookies that have low water activity and you know, are, are shelf stable. If you're making a fresh item, be really careful, um, really um, get a HACCP plan and um, get, a, get somebody who knows uh, quality and to make sure that your, your food's safe. I mean, I think that's, that can't be underestimated. Um, but, you know, I think the, the messaging, everything has to, to change when you do get a little bigger. Um, uh, at the same time, if you can grow while maintaining sort of a artisan or regional appearance, 
that you're going to do so much better uh, than, you know, just something that, I mean, the way most businesses work is people, marketing folks, um, study the markets, figure out what's trending, what's hot, you know, uh, what should I get into? And then they get into the space and, and they just copy everybody else. And it's just, they just rinse and repeat. And there's, I hate to see, you know, I, you know, there's no heart, there's no soul, there's nothing in that whatsoever. And it's just becomes another, now you're just fighting for shelf space. Everyone is doing the same thing. So if you start out as an artisan, you already have um, a leg up from all the other, you know, MBA types that come in that try to create a business. Because if you're an artisan, then you actually created a business from your heart, from your idea. Um, it's something that generated, that was generated from authenticity rather than, you know, you know, what, what lane should we get into? What business should we create? Mm. Um, it's that mindset, I think, that is really kind of derailing positivity. So the fact that you're, you're authentic, you have a story, you have purpose, a mission, I think that's a huge leg up. Now, just start thinking about all the strategic things. Um, you know, what do I have to do to make sure that my product uh, is safe in the marketplace? How do I get it? You know, what's the shelf life? Do product testing, make sure that you've got um, that you, uh, um, have pro done product testing, not just in terms of, of, uh, shelf life, but also, uh, that people actually really like it and would they pay money for it? So it don't, I mean, testing it on your friends and family is great, but a better thing to do is show up at a, at a farmer's market or an event where you're actually selling the product and see if people actually buy it, sample it and see if people actually buy it. Um, you know, there's so many pop-ups now. So take advantage of those uh, and then figure out, you know, which products uh, appeal the most, where should I focus, um, the bulk of my time, et cetera, um, you know, and figure out what your winning formula is. Um, and then, you know, and then grow it. Um, so I can't stress enough one other thing, which is hugely underrated by the experts, which is your own intuition. Um, and the ability to take a risk to bet on your own intuition. Um, most people that are professionals, that are experts, um, want to get all the data first. And they all forget that data is based on a rear view mirror of what the market's been up until now. If you're an artisan creating something new that the world hasn't seen before, there's no data on it. There was no data when I launched my, my cheese line on it. Um, so had I, you know, been an MBA creating a business, I would have said, well, why would I do this? There's no proven market for it. So, but if you, you know, if you have like, your gut is saying this is the right thing to do, it's very possible that it is the right thing to do. I so appreciate the nod to intuition. Um, I work with a woman who invented the Ergo baby carrier. And her story is very much not trusting all of the predominantly male advisors around her and like listening to herself. And she made these key pivots in the course of scaling the business that ended up driving her success. And I don't think in a business culture dominated by sort of capital M masculine logic, there's enough space for intuitive leadership in that way. You are so right. Um, absolutely. And it, this often derails companies at the end because you grow a company to a certain point and then the experts come in and they start telling you what to do. Mm. Um, so, you know, I've seen it time and time again, yeah. and then, you know, and then you just sort of water down the brand and everything else. And sometimes they're just not right. And, and the thing I always have to ask is if the experts were real experts, if they're so right, why didn't they start? Why didn't they have the idea? <laughs> so what has it been like for you, not only as a woman, <clears throat> a woman of color, working <clears throat> in Silicon Valley of all places, it's like the bastion of male economies. Um, how have you had to like confront bias, but also leverage your strength? Yeah, well, I mean, I can't say I've always been successful. I mean, let's just be honest. Um, the, the more successful you become, the bigger the pushback. Mm. 
the more the naysayers come out and say, well, you can't do that. You know, I mean, things that I, products that I would have just like created uh, that I think are brilliant and I still do. And I feel like in some ways there are things that, you know, where we've missed the opportunity, the experts come out and say, well, that's not really what we should be doing. Um, you know, and that's, that's, I mean, you get it all the time in the very beginning, no one really believes you, you know, they're like, I'm going to bet on you, but I'm also spreading my bets on everybody else. So like, but, you know, so I'm, you, you know, I'm, cause that's what, that's how they work. They, they, they bet on a bunch of people and in the hopes that one or two of them will succeed. And, and they don't really give you a lot of credence. They don't really get, but they don't really tell you what to do either because um, they don't really know what to do. They, I mean, because they're not really, um, you know, they realize that you have something that is unique um, and they're not an expert in that. So they want to see how far you can take it and they'll kind of leave you alone initially. And then when you start hitting certain um, points of success, that's when they kind of jump all over you and they start saying, well, this is how you should be doing it. This is how you should be doing it. You need to hire these people, blah, blah, blah. And oftentimes it's right. And oftentimes it's just, it's just wrong. Um, and um, things uh, go in a different direction than, than um, you know, so, and I think it's harder for a woman of color because the pushback is so much greater. I mean, I can tell you, there've been so many times when I've said, uh, we have to stop doing this or we have to start doing this. You know, in other words, I will tell the, the team or the board or whatever, and nobody listens to me. And then some white guy says, you know, we should start doing this or stop, stop doing that. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard this, I mean, I've heard this from many, many other women as well too. Um, but the higher, the more successful you become, expectations become so much higher. And of course I have high expectations too, but the judgment of you as the person that can get to that next level um, becomes um, challenging, you know, so or did or you take private equity or did you take an investor and now they are a part of the board? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, I sit on a private yeah. equity board. So I'm just like in this moment yeah. with you where I've watched a company that I sit on the board of really battle for its soul in the face of this presumption that experience in other areas of the marketplace can be leveraged um, yes. in this instance. And I'm not sure it can. Well, sometimes it can, and sometimes it just doesn't apply. You know, I, I would say in the area that we're working in, the sector of, of, uh, of veganism or creating a new, we're actually creating a new food system. We're not just putting products out there excuse me. <laughs> so if, for example, we were just making, I don't know, bars or potato chips or sauerkraut, um, we understand the market. But when you're creating foods that are trying to change consumer behavior and trying to pave the way for a future food system, it's a whole other thing. It's not just a food or a product. It's also partly a movement. It's partly activism. Um, it's a conversation. I mean, like we're a cult brand. I'm kind of a cult leader. I, you know, I can't tell you how much uh, just incoming, um, I don't know, messaging and feedback from just consumers that I get all from all these different platforms on, on not just the product, but you know what we're doing as a company or what I'm doing as as a human being, and. Um, it's, it's more than just making a product. It's actually a movement. It's, an, it's a form of activism, as I talked about. Um, and so the old rules sometimes just don't apply. Like you can't just come in and say, well, you know, when I had my last bar company, this is what I did. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work. Um, and I think they're, you know, they're, everybody wants to bring their expertise. I get it. There's a lot of ego in that boardroom. Um, and I think they just don't, get it and uh brands get watered down because of that and then it just becomes a brand it, that's all it becomes it's no longer a movement anymore it's it's been stripped of all of its authenticity um you know i've seen it 
before, but I think we're at a really unique point in human history where the fact that we're reinventing the food system is such a new thing that people just don't understand how it works. And they're trying to bring their same, you know, bag of tricks, their rinse and repeat tactics to it. Um, you know, that the expensive degrees they got. And, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see whether or not this movement remains a movement or we just become um, kind of soulless products on, on shelves again. Oh. I'm wondering about that moment that you sort of mentioned after the selling of your meat company and prior to the launching of your cheese company when you said you were depressed. And I'm hearing too now these moments of sort of like alienation from the ways that kind of capitalism usurps movements and yes. turns them into commodities. Yes, like exactly. What you, what's your soul building practice to kind of make yourself resilient in the face of that momentum? I, you know, I don't know that I'm very effective at that. I'm not, you know, I'm not like a, a good meditator or anything like that. Uh, I have animals, I, I have dogs and cats and uh, they give me lots of love. I've got amazing friends. Um, and, you know, I have a farmed animal sanctuary. Uh, and so we rescue farmed animals. Um, I think for me, um, what keeps me going is every single morning getting up and realizing I still have a mission. I still, I, Miyoko Shinner, as an individual, still have work to do despite, you know, whatever happens. Um, I still have um, work to do to inspire people, to get each individual to, to embrace activism on their own, uh, to take personal responsibility. Um, and, um, you know, I'm also thinking more that we have to move into a model of business that is less product oriented and more movement oriented. And what I mean by that is, you know, my, the, the next thing I'm thinking about is starting, um, like, I really believe that food culture is important. It's not just about what we, we're so focused on products today. And I think it started with TV dinners where uh, we stopped having family sit down dinners because now you could get a, a tray of TV dinners and watch TV and, and eat. And now we're, you know, we're in the world of celebrating burgers and chicken nuggets. These are experiences you have on your own. Like you're never going to take a platter of burgers to a potluck um, or a plate of chicken nuggets. These are like individual experiences. You go through a drive-in and you eat in your car, you take your, your, you know, your fast food and you eat in front of your computer, et cetera. And I just got back from Italy and there are places in the world today where um, food still means uh, social connection. Food is still about bringing people around the table and having conversation. And I believe that is partly where we get our humanity. That's where we build a sense of, of mutual trust and uh, friendship family. Um, and that, that nurtures us and allows us to go out into the world each and every single day, because we're not these sole individual, you know, these lonely individuals that sit in our cars alone and then sit in front of our computers and or in remote working sit in our homes um but food is is what draws us together and has been for thousands of years this is how that's that's the thing that separates us from animals one thing i observed when we first started the sanctuary and i got goats and ruminants was that they all eat on their own they're all like grazing on their own individually and they're not saying, you know what? I got some willow here. I got some juicy grass. Let's come together and make a salad. Like they're not doing that. They're, they're, they're on their own. Humankind, human, humans are the only species that actually, and I think some primates as well too, that actually, you know, takes, I got some roots. I got some leaves. Let's make, let's make a pot of soup together. Let's feed each other. Uh, you know, I will grow grains and you will, uh, I don't know, make something else and we'll make bread together. And we've been feeding each other as, hum as humankind for thousands of years. And we're not doing that anymore. We're losing that. When we lose that and we start becoming product focused, I think we become more capitalistic. We become less socialistic. 
and we lose um, a sense of community. And, and so <clears throat> one of my, my next goals is to figure out how to create a business model. Maybe it's a nonprofit model. Maybe it's not even a business model that really reignites food culture and brings people together. So I'm thinking of, for example, a series of um, long dinners, um, long dinner table dinners in urban settings um, around the country where people come together and they have prompts. So they have to talk to each other while they break bread. And you know, we work with different chefs in different regions, all vegan, of course. And we talk about the food system as a conversation. But you know, I want to figure out ways. How do we reignite food culture? How do we create more experiences where people do have to come together to eat, rather than oh, you know, I'll just grab something on my way home and eat it in the car? Like we we just have to break out of that. We have to re we have to recreate society. I interviewed a journalist uh, last week for the podcast, and we were kind of lamenting our inability to sit down and just be present with people we deeply disagree with. Yes. And I was reminded of Brene Brown and braving the wilderness and her notion that like, because we're not going to each other's weddings anymore, we're not going to each other's funerals, we're not doing birthdays together. We're not having those convivial moments of deep connection when we come at each other on Facebook or on Instagram and try to talk about ideas, there's no like, there's none of the like neediness of human humanity there, you know? It's like, it's so depraved and again, isolated. Um, and so I, I have to believe that food is a solution in that way and that we can come together experience joy, experience that moment of like, oh, this is delicious. And then begin yes. to walk towards. Because food is, isn't just a conversation. Food is a giving. It's an act of giving. Mm. And I want to nurture in people the idea that creating food and, and sharing, breaking bread together. I mean, this is the highest calling in some ways, in my opinion, because mm. it's not just for you. So, you know, I want to figure out in my next life, like what I'm going to do is about getting people back in their kitchens. And, and maybe it's through you buy one of those meal kits, but don't buy a meal kit for one or two, buy a meal kit for six and then share that. Now we got to get back into a place where we're, we're sharing food, we're breaking bread together um, because it's, a, it's, it's such a gift of love. Um, and we don't do that anymore. We, we take care of ourselves. That's all we think about. It's like, you know, I'll just get a frozen dinner and uh, nuke it and I'm done. Um, yeah, I keep thinking about how ironic it is that, <clears throat> and, and maybe it's not ironic, maybe it's connected that the very people that are preparing and growing the vast majority of our food in the United States don't have the means to sit down and eat dinner together, even though their lives are like so deeply scripted by this culture of convenience. And they themselves are then stripped of the ability to actually prepare meals in community and have time and space to eat together. It's like this deep, like two sides of the same coin. Um, that is a very, very painful picture you paint that is all true, all mm -hmm. too true. Um, in you know certain communities we know, you can't even buy food unless it's prepackaged for individual consumption mm -hmm. from a fast food joint. Like you could not even, if you were going to prepare a meal to share with your neighbors, mm -hmm. you'd have to travel outside of that community to go shopping. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're absolutely right. You know, it's, we need to figure out a way to create community mm -hmm. to allow for the sharing and breaking of bread in every single community. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, you know, you have this vibrant, successful business that scales, blows up, 
gets a cult following. And then you decide to move some of your energy into your nonprofit sort of movement building work. And I'm wondering if you can help people think through the strategy there. I mean, I've really heard the argument that like by having a mission-driven business, you are a part of building a movement through engaging customers to be more than just shoppers. But you also have this other complementary work. So can you tell us about the Farm Animal Sanctuary and your other nonprofit work and kind of how it all fits together? Well, it all fits together because it's all about the food system. The Farmed Animal Sanctuary is uh, about animals that would be commodified either for food or fashion or for some other use. Um, and I'll tell you about another nonprofit that I'm uh, that I co-found am co-founding right now as well called Leap Leaders for Ethics Animals and Planet, and it's an organization that we hope will be a thriving alternative to 4-H and FFA, Future Farmers of America. But all of these nonprofits are about shedding the focus on other living beings on this planet that we believe we can exploit and do whatever we want with. Um, in other words, but they're all tied to the food system in some way. Um, I believe these animals at the Farmed Animal Sanctuary Rancho Compasión um, that I founded um, uh, six years ago, really are ambassadors. They are the storytellers for, for their lives that are, you know, that could have gone a different way. Um, and so they are the ambassadors that when people come to visit and they connect with the animals, they go, oh my God, I had no idea that a pig or a goat could be so loving and would want to connect with me. I mean, people say, this, this goat's just like a dog. I had no idea. Um, and so it's, I find that work is, it's not really my work. I made it available. I created it. Now we have great staff and volunteers. And of course, the ambassadors themselves, the animals. Um, but every time people come that are non-vegan, that connect with the animals, it gets them to think about when they go back home and they are about to chomp on a burger, they think of Angel. And, or they think of when they're you know at a fancy restaurant, they might have foie gras, they'll think of Echo the Goose. That is the huge, he's, well, first of all, he's the Royal Guardsman for Angel the Cow, but he's also the most interesting character. He knows his name, he'll come running, and it just makes you think of them as individuals rather than just some species that exists for our purpose. Mm. And so that's why I feel that work is important because it's not just about rescuing a certain number of animals because there's no way to rescue all the animals that need to be rescued. Same thing with dogs and cats. But if you can rescue and create a wonderful environment for them where they can become ambassadors, then you've, come, then you've accomplished something. It's the same thing with LEAP, Leap, Leaders for Ethics, Animals, and Planet. If you can reach young people and give them a, a way to connect with animals at a young age and, and do meaningful work and become leaders that can uh, really start thinking about uh, the world today, about the food system, about um, you know, everything, out, the, everything else that we do to commodify animals. Um, and really nurture compassion in, in these young people, then I think that ties to why I make vegan cheese or write cookbooks or, you know, had an alt meat company. It's all connected. You have to first, you can't just point out the problem. You have to provide them the solution, which is the product. But at the same time, you have to be able to reach their hearts, not just point out the problem with some horrible you know, footage of a slaughterhouse on, on YouTube, you have to, because that horrifies people, you have to also reach their hearts. Mm. Yeah. I'm thinking about the juxtaposition between my own journey into veganism, going to college and getting all those PETA flyers of just like abused and tortured animals, which almost made me feel paralyzed in that moment. 
And then looking at my own daughter for her bat mitzvah, she did her service project at a farm animal, animal sanctuary and sort of got to connect with these sweet pigs that had escaped from a local piggery. Um, and just like thinking about their life and their future from that perspective, it definitely, I think resources her in her own journey in a different way than I was resourced when I saw those PETA flyers. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We need to people, we reach people through different avenues. Um, you know, it might be a delicious vegan product that someone buys and goes, wow, you know, I could eat this to, um, that experience your daughter had with pigs, um, or it could be a horrific, you know, image of some, um, I don't know, uh, slaughterhouse it, people resonate to different things, but at the end of the day, they all need to be connected. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have to work all angles, I feel. So speaking of another angle you're working on, can you tell us a little bit about the dairy farmer transition program that you're helping to foster? Yeah, so the program is really to find a dairy farmer and then have them uh, start growing crops um, instead and subsidize their transition because they would be losing government subsidies at that point. So the, the company would subsidize them. This has been a very, very long haul. It turned out to be much more complicated. First of all, looking for a farmer in California to prove to be pretty impossible because the farmers were warned by, the dairy farmers <laughs> were actually warned by, I think it was um, the California, was it the dairy, California Dairy Lobby? I can't remember, but they, someone sent out an email to all the dairy farmers in California telling them that, um, this woman from Miyoko's was going to be coming around and don't talk to her because she was the, the enemy. Um, and uh, of course, some farmers laughed at that. But at the point, the point is California dairy farmers are typically, they're bigger farms. They're not doing as poorly as in other parts of the, the country. We did find a farmer in New York that is interested. And we're going through a process right now. And it, it's turning to be turning out to be a very, very challenging because first of all, you have to identify what crops are you going to grow. Um, and that, of course, depends on what the region is. You know, is it in upstate New York or California, et cetera? What, what, and what's the terrain like? Um, and then it turns out it's, it's complicated. We were hoping originally it could become part of our supply chain, but th there were some complications there because one of the ingredients that we thought we could have grow, which was sunflower seeds to turn into oil, requires a $200,000 investment in, <coughs> in, like, a, in a, like a grain mill, <clears throat> which it doesn't exist on a dairy farm. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing, it, it's, and then we're, we're also partnering with Rodale Institute and Kitchen Table Advisors to help them, the farmer with the economics of the transition and crop rotation uh, for regenerative agriculture, et cetera. So there's a lot of resources going into this. But, um, you know, initially when I thought of the idea, I thought, oh, I'll just find a farmer and then, you know, we'll just pay him a certain amount to transition. It's just not that easy. Mm. So it's, um, it's a slower process than I had originally hoped, but uh, hopefully, you know, we can, um, tran hopefully we'll succeed in the end. <laughs> yeah. I mean, isn't that the story of the food system though? It's like you see this problem that on the surface seems like an easy solve. And then you realize that underneath the food system we all interact with are these complex systems of infrastructure, yes. resource allocation, Absolutely. And processing and storage yes. and regulation that props up the industrial food system. It yes. makes it easier to have a mega dairy than yes. it is to have a niche artisan, probably plant-based dairy company. Yes. Yes, you're absolutely right. And, you know, it's also easier to have a mega dairy than to have lots and lots of small family farmers, mm -hmm. which is why so many of them are collapsing um, around the country, you know. So if when Danone goes to the Northeast and says we're, they're cutting off contracts with 70 family farmers, they're out of business because Danone is creating their own mega factory, mega dairy. Um, so it, the industrialized uh, food system is hugely problematic in that it consolidates power in the hands of a few. 
And I would say that is one of my biggest warnings and concerns about what's happening in the so-called plant-based sector. Um, and if we remain this product focused, we put our resources into um, just substituting one product for another. In other words, cell-based for animal meat or, or even plant-based for animal meat. And, we, and the resources needed to create cultivated meat or precision fermentation are in the you know, billions of dollars, we're basically gonna be consolidating power in the hands of a few, just as we are today. Instead of Tyson, it's gonna be you know, some cultivated meat company that will control the food system again. And uh, I'm very much interested in diversification uh, and trying to create equity in the food system to give power to more people, to small stakeholder, you know, smallholder uh, farmers and and uh, producers, local producers. We need to figure out how do we do that? How do we decentralize it to so that we can create opportunities and equity for people um, across the world? I'm also concerned about. I've heard stories of some of these larger plant based companies eat well even i can't say plant based but you know the the new food whether it's cell based or whatever going into regions of the world such as africa that are struggling and saying we're going to solve your agricultural problems by installing this big bioreactor to produce you know this meat and we're going to continue colonialization mm. so these are this is once again, big money controlling it because this is exciting for investors because this is their way to continue to maintain control. And we really do need to really overhaul this entire system. In my yeah, opinion. I like to think of the transition out of the industrialized, centralized, corporatized food system, not as the introduction of one alternative, but rather the hollowing out by the creation of multiple decentralized place-based alternatives, yes. which if we connect into our place-based food cultures, it's actually the source of the most rich forms of deliciousness. Absolutely. Totally agree. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. I just got back from Italy. I was at a conference called the Edible Planet Ventures Summit to talk about the future food system. And I remember this amazing meal at a castle. And it was all vegan, except for they had a wild boar, but otherwise it was these local beans and lentils, uh, mm -hmm. these dishes, you know, there were like two or three or four dishes made out of local beans and lentils and lots of vegetables from the region and beautiful polenta with porcini mushrooms that had been forged locally. Mm -hmm. It was all local. It was amazing. Um, you know, aside from the wild boar, which of course I didn't touch, but, um, Nothing was from any kind of industrialized uh, company or whatsoever. And we can have that again. We can celebrate that again. But, you know, it's just not sexy to be putting, to, to be selling lentils. Mm. Investors don't want to invest in lentils. Mm. Well, Miyoko, I really appreciate you spending the hour with us. I'm wondering, is there any sort of like last call to action you have for folks if they're thinking about either starting a business or getting involved in transforming the food system, like a lesson learned or a, a North Star? I, I would, I mean, once again, I would say at this conference that I just went to, everyone was focused on, you know, we're doing regenerative or we're doing plant-based or whatever, but at the end of the day, they were all eating veal. Mm. And so, you know, I guess my question would be to each and every person, whatever it is you're promoting, practice what you preach. Mm. Really under, you know, if you're doing regenerative and you believe regenerative meat is the way to go, then only eat that. Don't make an excuse, well, it wasn't available. If you're plant-based and you're creating, creating mycelium, stick with plant-based because that don't, don't say it's a chemistry experiment and I'm doing it, um, you know, because it's a business, but on my own, I eat whatever. Like let's become people that actually have conviction in what it is we're doing and let's devote ourselves to that. And I think that's where the true, that's where the authenticity comes from. And that's why people are going to believe in you. 
Mm. Otherwise, it's a hollow promise. Mm. Well, that's a great way to end. <laughs> <laughs>